dad and I had always been pretty close to each other. When I first started in 4-H, dad bought me a purebred heifer. And we'd always been able to talk things out, kind of man to man. I guess that was partly because we'd practically grown up together. He was only 20 when I was born. And maybe it was partly because I'm the only boy. But things had been changing. Not seriously, you understand, but not nearly so pleasant as they used to be either. And then, on this particular Sunday, we got pretty close to a big argument. And Dad had said, let's get out of the house and see if we can talk this over. Well, neither one of us knew where to start, till Dad said, What's it all about, son? What's coming between us? Nothing, Dad, nothing. Just a few minutes ago, you were saying some pretty rough things. Yeah, I, I blew my top, I guess. I'm sorry. Well, that's not the point, Dad. You must have had a good reason. And that reason is much more important than, well, than just being sorry. I suppose. But I was wrong. This is your farm. It doesn't make any difference how you want to run it. Oh, so that's what's sticking in your craw. It's that blamed old pasture that's been making you so touchy lately. Well, let me tell you just once again. That was a good pasture in your grandfather's time. That is still pretty good. Well, look at it. Well, maybe it's not worth putting any money in, but... Well, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking quite serious of selling off those steers and just forgetting about it. But that's just where you're wrong, Dad. Well, that land isn't good for anything but pasture, but it can be turned into good pasture. And you could make money with it. Why, you could make as much money with that pasture as you do with the best land on a farm. Yeah, and another thing. I'm not just talking about that pasture either. I'm talking about using grass as a rotation crop. Well, then you'd have enough feed for an even bigger herd. And another thing, you'd be improving the soil at the same time. Uh, oh, gosh, Dad, there I go, flipping my lid again. Where are you getting all this stuff, Dan? Oh, my vocational agricultural class. Oh. Well, I suppose they know what they're talking about. Well, I've seen it on our field trips, over on Town Line Road on the Bollinger Farm. Mr. Bollinger's got an improved pasture on land that's too steep and too poor for anything else. Nutrients equal to 110 bushels of corn per acre. Why, he's getting from four to six times the yield he got before he improved it. His beef is costing him about $8 a hundred. And right down the road, dry lot feeding's costing a neighbor of his more than $20 a hundred. Mr. Bollinger always has part of his farm in rotation pasture, too. That way he can use it for hay or silage part of the time, and for pasture the rest. Our VOAG teacher says that's the way to get a good balance, because when there's more than the cattle need, it can be cut for use when there's not enough pasture. And that's the cheapest kind of feed you can get, whether it's for beef cattle, dairy cows, sheep, or pigs. You're certainly worked up on this, aren't you, Dan? Yeah, I, I guess so. And if you'll come in the house, I'll prove it to you. Look, Dad, we're going to need a lot more good grass if we're going to produce all the beef, milk, lamb, and pork to keep everybody well fed. Oh, and another thing, Dad. The farmers can make more money while they're at it, too. And we need that grass, too, Dad, to stop the wind and rain that's stripping the rich topsoil from our land. Why, without plenty of good grass, our whole way of life will change. Is it really that serious? I've got things on grass here from all over the country, and they all tell the same story. Here's one from the Department of Agriculture. And this one's put out by the University of Missouri. Oh, and here's one that's from the Michigan State College. And this is put out by the Joint Committee on Grassland Farming. Oh, and this one tells what happened at Central Kentucky Grass Day. And of course, this last one is what they're recommending in Southern Illinois. And here's a whole stack of stuff by one of the leading authorities on grassland farming. Why, he's written books, magazine articles, and he's made lots of speeches about it, too. He was a farm boy, just like me, Dad. And he got his start in a pasture research laboratory for the government. And he won the Stevenson Award for Outstanding Crop Research. He studied forage crop research in Europe. And then they made him head agronomist on forage crops and diseases for the Department of Agriculture. Must be quite a guy. Who is he? Well, Dad, he's Dr. Will M. Myers. And right now he's over at the university working on grassland research. I. I'd like to go see him, Dad. Do you think he'd talk to me? 
Well, I don't know, son. Man like him, he must be pretty busy. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he is. But if you let me go, Dad, I'll take the chance. You think you'd learn something that might convince me, Dan? Well, it might help. If I could talk to an expert like him. But there's another reason, Dad. I'm going to be in the speaking contest this year. And there's a darn good prize in it, too. A year at the State University with all expenses paid. You know old Mr. Wickensham. Well, he offers it every year for the best speech made by a member of the senior class. Your mother was in that contest. Let's see. Nineteen years ago. She didn't win, but she came close. Got two of the five votes. Mm-hmm. Mom told me once. Well, what about it, Dad? What about what? Can I go see Dr. Myers? <clears throat> You'd uh, talk about grass. Well, sure, Dad. I decided that months ago. Well, all right, you. You go and see if Dr. Myers can help you out. Thanks, Dad. Do you know, sometimes I wonder. What, Dad? I wonder if your mother had won that year in the university, if she'd come back and married me. Well, I hope so, or else I wouldn't be in this year's contest. <laughs> Dr. Myers? Yes, come in. Now, I'm Dan Weston from over near Garrettsville. Well, glad to meet you, Dan. Nice to meet you, Doctor. I, uh, I'm going to be in a speaking contest, going to talk about grassland farming. And I wondered if you'd tell me a few things. Well, yes, uh, won't you sit down? Yes, thank you, Doctor. As a matter of fact, I just finished my budget request for this next year, and I'd rather like to get back to farming. Now, let's see. Uh, I'll start talking, and uh, you interrupt if you have any questions. In the first place, uh, there's some uh, confusion about the meaning of uh, grassland farming. Grassland farming means different things to different people, but basically it applies to all farm areas. Some people have the idea it means putting all their land in grass, and in some cases they're right. Rough, hilly farms that aren't suited to cultivation should be turned into improved pasture lands. That's a way to make neglected parts of many farms just as productive with grass as the level fields are with cultivated crops. But grassland farming goes much further. It also includes grass in the crop rotation on rich prairie and good bottom land. During the grass rotation, the farmer is turning forage into meat and milk. And at the same time, he's building up his soil for the crops that follow. For instance, corn yields after a grass crop have been as much as two thirds higher than they were on the same farms following oats. In some instances, the yield has been even higher. Now, that's only one of many examples, and we'll go into the reasons later if you're interested. But I want to make this point first. Grass is the largest agricultural resource that's still left open for expansion. And it has to be expanded if we're going to have a permanent agriculture in this country. We must treat grass as a crop. <laughs> you can help clear up something for me there, Dr. Myers. You know, I've read that we have over one billion acres in grasslands right now. I know I'm wrong, but well, shouldn't that be enough? That's a question we often hear, Dan. But much of those billion acres is poor land in sections where rainfall is greatly limited, like on the open ranges of the West, where per acre yields are very low. Cattle and sheep even here can be increased 50%. There's another 120 million acres of hayland and cropland pasture. 110 million acres of permanent pasture, almost one-fourth of a billion acres in the humid part of the United States. Some of it improved, but much of it worn out. That's where our big opportunity is. We know now how to increase our productivity from two to six times. When that knowledge is put to work, we won't have to be worried about a permanent prosperous agriculture, nor how we're going to keep Americans well fed. The North Central and Northeast regions can boost their cattle and sheep production by 240%. And in the Southeast, 475% more can be raised by converting abandoned, idle, and low-producing cropland into pastures and hay fields. That's what we need. That's what agriculture needs, Dan. More farmers growing more good grass and turning it into meat and milk. Many of them are doing it now and have been doing it for years. They're doing it at much greater profit and with much less labor. As an example, when a rotation was changed from one acre out of four in grass 
to three acres out of five in grass, 50% more feed was produced on each acre, and it cost less to produce the feed. It's been proved time after time that grass and legumes are the cheapest feed you can find. And when it comes to harvesting a crop, you can't beat the cow as a labor saver. Milk from pasture costs less than half as much as milk from homegrown grains. A farmer in Ohio, for instance, is turning grass into $163 worth of milk to the acre. And two acres of improved grassland in the Northeast can produce all the forage that a dairy cow needs, including silage and hay. Forage produces the lowest cost beef, too. Beef cattle in Mississippi gained 326 pounds per acre during 162 days. And there was a net profit of $84 per unit, almost twice as much as animals fed in the dry lot. In Illinois, steer beef on pastures costs about $8 per hundred, while dry lot feeding costs more than $20 per hundred. Farmers are having those experiences in all parts of the country, with pigs and sheep, and with poultry as well as with cattle. All farmers can make more money with less work once they realize that grass is a crop that needs attention just like any other crop. And don't overlook the fact that while the farmer is making more money with less labor by combining good grassland with livestock, he's also doing something else. He's building up yields of his cultivated crops when they follow grass in the rotation. Well, after a farmer decides to go into grassland farming, Dr. Myers, how does he go about it? Well, I can't give you any more than a general answer to that, because each farm is different in its topography, in its soil, and in its existing pasture. And climate has a big effect, too, on what kinds of seed they're used. Your county agent and the soil conservation man are the people to see. They know the local conditions. I understand they had a pretty good rain just north of here yesterday, Ben. Yeah, they did. You sure could use some, too. Radio this morning said it's the longest dry spell we've had in 10 years. Yeah, I guess so. Look, Joe, you didn't ask me to come over to talk about the weather, did you? Well, no, not really. What I wanted to ask you, Ben, was, uh, well, you being the county agent and all, you uh, get around and probably know what some of the others are doing about grassland farming. <laughs> Last time I tried to talk to you about grass, well, you didn't show much interest. Now you invite me to come over. Well, now, don't get like me. something's going to happen. Well, get the idea. I'm changing my mind. I just want to know what's going on, that's all. That's a good idea, Joe. Well, first of all, you ought to get a test made of your soil to find out about the fertilizer. And then you better stop in and see Bill Hayes, the soil conservation man. That boy of yours coming along, you'll have to do a lot more farming on the acres you've got. Okay, okay. But tell me, uh, how does the rotation pasture fit into this idea? Well, there are three types of pastures, generally speaking, Joe, and at least two of them are needed for a balanced farm program. Let's take a look at your farm, see how it might be laid out. Fields one, two, three, and four, we'll say, are in a rotation of corn and oats, followed by two years of legume grass. Field three, let's say, is in its first year of grass, and it's cut for hay and silage. Maybe number four is a second year field, so it's divided into three pastures for rotation grazing. Now this field, number five, you'll want to leave permanently in legume grass because erosion would be too serious if it's cropped. Uh-huh. I think I get that, Ben. But let's go back over it again. Sure. Permanent pasture should be kept fertilized and, of course, renovated once in a while. That's a way to keep it productive. Well, gosh, Dr. Myers, I thought the droppings would be enough fertilizer. Oh, uh, that's a common mistake. But there are always lots of calcium and phosphorus and potassium that are being removed in meat and bone or milk. And because these minerals often aren't replaced, we have many worn-out permanent pastures that are producing little feed. I've got some things here on renovating old pasture that you might like to look over. Oh, sure, Dr. Myers. I'd be glad to have anything. Well, between Dr. Myers and these pamphlets, I really learned something. For instance, I found out that where there's danger of erosion or crusting, use a disc or a deep tillage tool or a spring tooth harrow. This will destroy the old plants, but they should be left at or near the surface. 
because the organic matter from them cuts down the danger of erosion and prevents soil puddling and crusting. So it's easier for water to penetrate and it's easier for the young seedlings to break through. And in the case of cultivated crops, sod mulch is just as important. Where there's no danger from erosion, plowing is the easiest way. Dr. Myers warned against improving too much land at one time. It's better to do a good job with a small area each year. When the improvement is made in installments, then it keeps pace with the expansion of your herd and the addition of buildings and equipment. Renovated pastures produce so much more feed than old neglected pastures that there's often more than the available livestock can use if too much is improved at one time. Besides starting out with a small area, that small area must be fenced off from the unimproved pasture. That fence will protect the improved pasture from overgrazing and it will also prevent the old part from going to waste. Now, if you'll read over this material, I think it'll answer a lot of the questions you have. Now, I hope I've not been giving you too much at one time, Dan. <laughs> oh, don't you worry about that, Dr. Myers. If I can't use it in my speech, I've got another place to use it. In your case, Joe, it'd be practical to plan on a rotation pasture as part of your farm cropping program. Well, I don't get that, Dan. Well, here's one reason. Around the middle of summer, you're apt to have a shortage in your permanent pasture. If that happens, then the rotation pasture can carry your livestock through. Why in the rotation pasture, not in the permanent pasture? Well, that's because the grasses and legumes, like alfalfa and brome grass in the rotation pasture, have deeper roots. So they get down to moisture when there isn't much rain. And they can be harvested for hay and silage when there's plenty of other pasture. That gives you more acres in pasture when production's low. Now, when our forefathers first broke the land, tall prairie grasses grew on large acreages. The upper portion of the soil was rich in plant food, containing many roots, and was permeable to air and water. These grass roots penetrated the topsoil, enabling it to soak up rainfall as rapidly as it fell. Floods and erosion were practically unknown. Today, too much of our soil is run together because it's been over-cultivated and the organic matter has been burned out. Close examination of the soil shows that the plow layer is the most compacted and the least permeable. Plant roots can't get through this kind of soil easily and they have trouble breathing freely. The soil below the plow layer still retains much of its original structure. Bare soil exposed to the beating of rain soon forms a crust that keeps out water and air. Rain puddles these overworked soils and either stands in the field causing a drainage problem or runs off causing erosion. Sod crops change all that. The long roots of the legumes penetrate deep into the subsoil, while the grass roots open up the topsoil to a loose, coarse, granular structure. It's a serious matter, Joe. And it gets more serious every year that grass is left out of the rotation. Every place you go, Dan, you'll find grass crops helping improve yields from other crops in the rotation. At the Mississippi State College, for instance, Professor W.R. Thompson, he's known as a pasture man all through the South, he tells us that cotton acreage has been reduced, but cotton production has gone up because they've been growing good grass in rotation. Well, I've heard some things about rotation grazing, too, Dr. Myers. But I don't think I understand it very well. From what Dr. Myers said, I realized I'd better explain the difference between rotation pastures and rotation grazing, because some people are confused. The rotation pasture, of course, is another crop that takes its place in the program, rotating with tobacco, corn, wheat, or anything else. Rotation grazing means that the pasture is grazed completely for a certain number of days and then the livestock is moved to another rotation pasture. And this one is given about mm, a month to recover. If the first field is ready for grazing again before the cows have eaten down the others, then the grass in the first pasture should be harvested for hay or silage. That's very important, Dr. Myers said, because grass should be either grazed or mowed before it becomes too matured. It loses much of its feed value after it goes beyond a certain stage of growth. 
A new practice on some farms is that of bringing the pasture to the cattle. By this method, it's possible to get a bigger yield of forage from the given acreage. And in the case of dairy herds, milk production is reported to be appreciably stepped up. Dr. Meyer says that eventually, every well-managed farm will be able to produce and store good quality roughage for winter feeding and for emergencies such as drought. It is now generally recognized that for the most economical production of livestock, particularly dairy cows, beef cattle, and sheep, a much higher proportion of nutrients must come from forage, and that means good quality hay and silage during several months of the year. If the forage is to keep the maximum amounts of digestible nutrients, it must be cured with a minimum loss of leaves without bleaching from long exposure to the sun or allowing it to get wet from rain or dew after it's partly dry. A hay crusher will cut drying time in half. That's why it's so important to cut no more hay at any one time than can be handled properly. Grass in the form of silage is the cheapest winter feed on the farm. Carotene is also preserved much better than in hay. Cows, for example, when they're fed enough grass silage, will produce milk in the winter that has as much color as when they're on pasture in spring and summer. It's been called winter pasture. They like it. It's palatable and succulent. So when they're fed silage plus hay, they eat more dry matter than when they're fed on hay alone. With that method of feeding, Forage supplies much more of the nutrient requirements, and the production of meat and milk is much more economical. That's only part of the story, Dan, but I hope I've told you enough to help you win that speaking contest. Making use of grass is one of the greatest opportunities the farmers of this country have ever had. It's an opportunity to make more money with less labor now and in the future. And I hope to prove, Dr. Myers, that you haven't been wasting your time. I'm sure I haven't. They're doing it at much greater profit and with much less labor. For example, when a rotation was changed from one acre out of four in grass to three acres out of five in grass... Why, Joe Weston! If you're that interested, why don't you go inside where you can hear them good? Interested in what? You know very well what you're interested in grass and what Dan's saying about it. I don't know where you get some of your ideas. You mean to tell me you weren't talking to the county agent about grass for a couple of hours when he was here last week? He mentioned a few things about it. Well, then why don't you go in and help Dan? You know how he feels about winning that contest. He's doing all right. Well, I'm going in. You can just stay here and be stubborn. I say that it's an opportunity. But it's much more than that, Dr. Myers told me. The expansion of grassland farming is a necessity if not an obligation to our future. Almost 7,000 new American customers for farm products are born every day. Now that rapidly growing population can be well fed only if we turn more and more good grass into more and more meat and milk and reverse the declining fertility of our cultivated acres. Now, we've already wasted too much time. Immediate widespread action is needed to protect the future of this nation the future that rests on a prosperous agriculture. Now, research workers have made, and are continuing to make, great contributions to the program of grassland farming. Improved varieties of grasses are being bred to develop the very best for every climate. We are learning more about the best methods of establishing seed beds, and about better methods of management. Livestock, particularly adapted to grassland farming, is being developed and machinery specifically for grassland farming is being designed and tested. The need for all this experimental work is widely recognized. We've come a long way, but so far we've actually only scratched the surface of learning how to grow and use good grass. One of the most encouraging evidences is the experimental work being done by large corporations that have only indirect gains to be made from the expansion of grassland farming. On experimental farms such as these, new ideas are being tested, and many of them are finding their way into practical farming. We are learning more each day of what must be done, and that knowledge put to use by farmers with vision gives us good reason for looking optimistically toward the future. You gave it very well, Dan. I didn't understand it, Danny, but I liked it. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you must have worked pretty hard. Thought your grammar was pretty limpy in spots. Oh, it was wonderful, Danny. And if Dan doesn't speak that silly boyfriend of yours, I'll get up and scream. Oh, hey, you better not, sis. Not bad, Dan, not bad. You might have borne down a little heavier on some points, maybe. I don't think you even mentioned the seeding of annual legumes like Lespedeza and permanent pastures. Well, gee, Dad, how did you know? Oh, I get around a little too, son. Isn't that right, honey? One of the most encouraging evidences is the experimental work being done by large corporations. On their experimental farms, new ideas are being tested, and many of them are ending up in practical farming. We are learning more each day of what must be done, and that knowledge put to use by farmers with vision gives us good reason for looking optimistically towards the future. The 20th annual Wickensham Night has come to a close. We are now ready to announce the judge's decision, and according to custom, Mr. Wickensham will collect the vote from the judges and will tell us who has won the scholarship at the university. This contest must be decided before the university opens its fall term in September. Judges have reached their decision on tonight's winning speech. This decision, which was split three to two incidentally, is based on what the majority of the judges believe to be the best display of thought, continuity, research, and delivery. Both of the top contestants spoke on the same subject, a subject of the greatest importance to farmers everywhere and the winner of the 20th annual speech contest is Ellsworth Schnorr. Mother, I guess it's time to go home. rather be by yourself? No, I don't think so. I feel pretty bad about it, Dad. Yeah, it was tough. I guess I just didn't try hard enough, huh? Why, you did a fine job. Well, I, I just didn't know, Dad. I mean, I could have done a whole lot better if I'd known how important it was to you. Me? Why, it is you I was thinking about. That's the way we used to talk. Yep, and that's the way it's going to be from now on. Okay, Dad. No more arguments. Not even about grass. Particularly not about grass. Because <laughs> we're going to fix up that old pasture. Oh, swell, Dad. And we're going to put grass in the rotation, too. You know, I wouldn't have believed it a minute ago, but there are more important things than just losing a speaking contest. There certainly are, son. Why, with this grasslands idea, we've got hold of the most important thing that could happen to this farm. Or at any other farm, for that matter. You bet, Dad. Well, we didn't lose tonight, we won. <laughs> <laughs>